did um, just mention uh, another person <coughs> who I think is important to, whose contributions are important to social science in general and particularly the study of narrative. And uh, I'm pretty sure he was mentioned prominently in the in the Reisman article yesterday. His name is Elliot Mishler, and he's a, some of you are nodding your heads, he's pretty famous, he's a social psychologist. And um, again, in that mid-80s period that I talked about a lot yesterday, he was even a little earlier, I looked it up last night, it was 1984, and he wrote a book called The Discourse of Medicine. Um, and the discourse, really the discourses of medicine, what he was looking at was, um, and he does a lot of kind of uh, very fine linguistic analysis in some of his work. And he was looking at how patients and doctors talk and why there's often problems. And he came up with this um, concept of the voice of, of medicine and the voice of the life world, and how different they are in character, which then it's not surprising that doctors and patients sometimes have trouble talking with one another. And really, I think several people are alluding to this. I'm going to go back to Arthur um, Kleinman, who in his way talks about that same difference, and I think you saw in the hate it, Patternity uh, article for today, the diff um, when they were talking about taking a history, that definitely is the voice of medicine, and patients have trouble fitting into that mold, and they really shouldn't. Um, they're the voice of the life world. So I wanted to mention Mishler in that way, and then um, he comes up again um, with another book he wrote um, in the early 90s um, called, I may have, I might have the date wrong, but anyhow, it's, it's research interviewing. And yeah, I guess it was more like late 80s. And this is a book that is cited a lot and referred to a lot. Um, and he comes up with what we would, I think now think of as, well, yes, of course, but at that time it wasn't yes, of course, which is that the researcher um, is part of that interview situation and how it comes out isn't just based on what your interviewee is telling you, it's uh, how you are asking questions and how you respond to questions and whether you interrupt um, your interviewee, whether you change topics, um, all of that goes into shaping the meaning of that conversation between the interviewer and the interviewee. And prior to uh, Mishler writing that, it was kind of assumed that the research interviewer was kind of this, I don't know, totally objective, standing kind of outside the interview, asking standardized or semi-standardized kinds of questions, and really it was all about what the answers that the interviewee gave um, without seeing that it was really a holistic interaction. And that's what he pointed out, and it's that was a very important insight that people just didn't have up to that time. I, I was gonna, I don't know, maybe you have to be there to get the humor of this, but in working with Paul Hated on those patient interview transcripts, we look at the transcripts and uh, we see really clear instances where one of us or whoever was interviewing inadvertently just kind of cut into the interviewee's responses or got the interview on a whole other track um, 
when maybe that patient was about to tell us something important and we cut it off. So when we were coding those interview transcripts, the code for that was um, the Mishler code, that we Mishlered somebody by cutting them off. Okay. Um, so I'll refer to him a couple times today. Um, so these are the kinds of things that are at stake um, between um, patient and doctor when they talk to each other for uh, an exchange of information, trying to solve problems, and I, at, first of all, identify and define those problems. Um, I don't know about the healthcare system here in Singapore, but it's a pretty complicated one in the U.S. Complicated by, you know, specialty care and levels of hospitals and insurance plans and all kinds of things. So, um, feeling like your provider is your advocate is important. Um, that. You don't have to love your doctor, but you need to have a functional relationship with your providers. Um, outcomes that are satisfactory to both parties, and um, hopefully getting cured, but that's not always possible, but you at least want to be able to care for it. So what gets in the way? And here is where we start getting into the voice of the life for a little bit and versus the voice of <coughs> medicine. So for patients, at least in the US system, there are often long waits. Um, even when you have an appointment, you arrive on time, but you might still sit in the waiting room for half hour or an hour. Um, and then when you get in to see the doctor, you feel like, oh, that person is so busy, we have to kind of get through this in a hurry. The average appointment, again, average, this really varies, is, between, is around 18 minutes. Um, the feeling that doctors don't speak plain English, they don't speak in, in plain language that's easily understandable. They may not explain things very well. Um, sometimes patients feel like they're really not treated as a complete human being. Not all the time, of course, but sometimes um, doctors don't take my opinions into consideration. Um, and uh, lately, <laughs> This probably wasn't the case decades ago where doctors made all the decisions for patients, but now since there's an awareness that patients have a stake in their um, health care, it sometimes goes to the other extreme, where instead of there really being collaborative decision making, it's like, okay, here are your choices. You know, you decide what you want to do, and patients don't always feel adequate to do that. Um, and then in our system, constraints with the payment systems, um, managed care, which means you're in a, in a certain health plan and to go outside that health plan may not be possible or may be a big hassle. Oops. Um, From the doctor's point of view, uh, and I mentioned this the other day when I gave the talk, um, patients are disorganized, which means they're not maybe fitting into the time slot um, that the doctor feels is available, and they don't follow that heuristic that Paul Hayden talked about. There's certain um, things that doctors are looking for. The, uh, that they're taught to do, what's the current complaint, what's the history of that complaint within certain boundaries. Um, and um, if patients aren't presenting, which often they're not, in that kind of heuristic form, then they get labeled as unreliable historians 
which doesn't mean I think you brought it up the other day. They definitely have a history, but it's not the same history as the doctor is looking for in that format. Um, patients may not be compliant with what doctors have suggested to do. Um, this is a constraint of the system. Um, the doctors get uh, reimbursed by their insurance company or by their healthcare organization um, much more for doing procedures than for sitting there talking to patients. So they don't have great incentive to do that communication bit. Um, litigation, possible litigation. Um, so there's the practice of defensive medicine to cover your behind. Um, you don't get sued. Um, a big feeling of providers in the American system is that they've lost autonomy. There's not a whole lot of doctors who are out there in single practices anymore, so they work within uh, the constraints of a managed care system with lots of rules and um, times that are set up for them and it may not be the way they want to practice medicine. Um, lots of paperwork and most recently electronic medical records which in theory should make things easier but in practice from what I'm hearing from the physicians um, it is actually more time consuming for them and then stress and burnout. So here are some of the topics that are, and there's many more of course, but some of the things that um, people who study patient-doctor communication who focus on that um, are, are interested in. Okay, so, could you, yeah. Could you elaborate on what you mean by health disparities? Yes, oh yeah, is that, that's not a, um, a term that's to... used. Okay, so health disparities mean that the health outcomes, I'm glad you asked that, the health outcomes, um, well, it could be health outcomes that people do better and worse. It could also be a disparity in even accessing health care. Um, and these are often along the lines of race, ethnicity, mm -hmm. socioeconomic class, gender, um, and one of, one of the projects I worked on had to do with um, access to healthy foods in rural areas where mm -hmm. there's much less choice. Mm -hmm. um, so even geographic positioning mm -hmm. could be a cause of disparity. Mm -hmm. I just saw um, yesterday online in the news, a, a new study about women's health in the U.S., and it, it was shocking to me. I should have copied it and brought it in. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. Um, where um, mortality, early mortality rates for women in the U.S. are shockingly on the rise. Um, and um, the headline was women dying before you their mothers. Um, so younger women are um, are not doing well on a on a health basis, and I, I had no idea about that. That was really surprising to me. But that would be a very good example of a disparity where women in the society are dying much earlier than men, or the women that came before them. Mm -hmm. Or anything else on there that I should? Racial ethnic concordance. This is kind of a, a, a concept in doctor patient communication where um, the communication, the studies <coughs> that have been done on that show that when the provider and the patient are from the same racial and or ethnic groups, that the communication goes much better, which I guess mm -hmm. shouldn't be surprising, but like in the U.S. context, we don't have enough um, African-American doctors to go around for the African-American population. 
so that concordance isn't always possible. Mm -hmm. But we know that it, things work better mm -hmm. like that. Um, divided loyalties. Um, with the advent of managed care and doctors working for these large corporate health care systems, um, sometimes the rules of that system interfere with the way they'd like to practice medicine and what they feel is best for their patients. So for example, their health care system often has a drug formulary and there are certain drugs they can prescribe within that system and, and patients are able to access, but they may feel that a drug outside that formulary would be much better for their patient's health, but um, they're not allowed to do it because they have to work within that system. So that's what I mean about <coughs> divided loyalties. Right, so connected to this, I was actually looking for something <coughs> that's not apparently in your list, which is when patients, for example, are much more into naturopathy or homeopathy, mm -hmm. and then the doctors always want to push the aggressive drug taking route. Yes. And those kinds of conflicts that arise between patients and doctors. Yeah, so I talked about that a little bit on Friday when I talked about integrative medicine, but, uh, and it was the case both in Singapore and the US. So patients go on their own for what they considered natural remedies or homeopathic, because you can, at least in the US, buy that without a prescription over the counter. So patients are doing a lot of that for themselves, and they don't communicate that to their doctors. And in Singapore, it's definitely with traditional Chinese medicine, um, or a subset of the population, and maybe Ayurvedic um, kinds of healing they're not telling their Western trained doctors <laughs> that they're doing that. Um, and yes, that's, that's a problem. I, I mean, in some, in some cases, the Western medicine that they're taking and the uh, alternative medicine may not you know, go together well, but nobody knows that they're doing both those things. Mm -hmm. In a way, I, this is a much bigger category, but I'd sort of fit that under cultural competency mm -hmm. that uh, we're trying to teach cultural competency to our healthcare professionals. And one aspect of that would be to try and understand the culture that the patient is coming from and what the common ways of treating somebody for a certain ailment in that culture, or simply to ask the question, we try and <laughs> train doctors to ask this question, and they most often don't. What are you doing for yourself to help with this problem? If they just ask that question, they don't have to be knowledgeable about everything in traditional Chinese medicine, although in, in a population like Singapore that would help, but at least to ask that question so the patient knows it's okay to talk about that and so the doctor is informed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so where the power lies in the doctor-patient situation, um, there's, there's different models for how this works. The classic medical model is the doctor is in charge, the patient is passive recipient. So I talked the other day about Gina, the woman with diabetes, and that she was trying to be a more active patient. I didn't really talk about that on Friday. I talked about integrative medicine, but there were um, students there from the econ department. I'm not really sure why they came, but they were there. <laughs> and so at the end, um, one of the students, and I think she had come from mainland China, and she said, why would somebody want to be an active patient? I want to go to the doctor and have, the doctor knows everything, I want him to decide, I just want him to take care of me and tell me what to do. And so 
you know, that's, that's her prerogative. Um, and I don't know if that's the way things typically go in mainland China, but that was, and she, she was pretty young. Um, so that would be an example of a classical um, medical model. A more consumerist model um, goes in the other direction. The patient feels like I'm paying this doctor as kind of my employee. Um, I'm in charge and that provider is there to supply information and services to me. Um, and then this collaborative model where there is a more egalitarian kind of relationship um, that, I mean, I, my bias is in this direction because I feel like if the patient doesn't speak up, the doctor can prescribe medication, can make lifestyle suggestions for changing, but it's the patient that has to enact that, and they also know what their life situation is, what might interfere with some of those instructions. So if the patient isn't ready to contribute that information, I feel like the problem solving often doesn't work. But nonetheless, you know, if someone wants to go with the classical medical model, that is their prerogative. So for doctors, doctors are aware of this, and um, <laughs> it's a hard job to kind of figure out where is this patient at in terms of their attitude, and uh, can I shift my style around to match the patient's style? So I have, um, empathy for the doctors, because that isn't easy. Um, I think that just by, I, I think the internet has made a huge difference in how people deal with their own health care. Um, I mean, there's information seeking of all kinds that is so available to many people now, and I'm not saying everybody utilizes this, but a lot of people do. And even 10 years ago, um, people wouldn't have been able to get the information that's available now um, just by Googling on the, the internet. And then other forms of media that have been around for a while. So I don't know. On, like your local news here, is there usually a health segment? Yes, there's a <coughs> supplement on Wednesdays or Thursdays called Mind Your Body, uh -huh. which has lots of health-related information, interviews with doctors, um, patient letters consulting about different conditions, mm -hmm. and then they have a section where they consult for the same letter, they consult both a Western doctor and a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. Oh, I would love to see that. I am very limited in my hotel as to what it's Wednesday. The, street, yeah. the Straits Times. So I think it's Wednesday or Thursday that has the mind. Oh, in the, in the in the newspaper. Yeah. Oh, that I can get. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> on our local, um, both national, but a lot on the local TV, there are health segments almost every day, um, making people aware of diseases, of um, resources, where they can go on our local radio stations. I mean, health information and medical information is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. I'll have to look at the straight times. Thursdays? Maybe today. What is Wednesdays? Today. Oh, Wednesdays. Today. Okay. Thursdays. It's today's. Thursdays. Okay, Thursdays. great. Okay. Um, Urban. I <laughs> talked a, a little bit last week about there are actually being programs to train people to ask questions. And that might seem kind of elementary, but people get really um, kind of um, cowed when they, sometimes when they go into the doctor's office, they realize there's limited time, or they may feel like their questions don't have merit. Um, people just don't speak up for themselves. So um, there's actual programs available to help people become more active question um, 
question askers, because um, that's, that's really important. Um, as chronic disease becomes more prevalent, and it's already very prevalent, people are living longer, but they're living longer with chronic diseases, um, then more of the management falls onto the individual. I mean, doctors can't take care of everything. It's not in the hospital, it's not under their control. They can make suggestions, but then patients have to enact that. Um, okay, going, seeking second opinions, referrals to other kinds of experts, either uh, Western medicine or not. Um, and then um, we see health activism much more on the rise. I think this started with the women's movement, probably in the 1970s, um, with the AIDS activists in the 80s, and now all kinds of groups are out there in the public sphere on their own behalf. Okay, uh, we talked about Walter Fisher yesterday and um, humans as storytellers. We've talked about these different aspects of, of narrative. And we talked about the functions of narrative. So I'm going through this pretty quickly. Those who weren't around for the other two sessions, um, this is in the slides, but I'm not going to spend time on it because we've talked about it a lot. Um, Rita Sharon, who I talked about yesterday, who trains her, her medical students and residents um, to do close readings of patient stories uh, and to try and think empathically in terms of the patient's point of view with her parallel charts. Um, medicine practice with the narrative competence to recognize, <coughs> absorb, interpret, and be moved by patients' stories of illness. Um, my friend Paul Hayden, who you read today, not in that article, but in one that you'll read later, came up with this kind of interesting concept that he calls a narrative jolt. So he's talking about doctors being in their biomedical mold and doing the kinds of histories that they're taught to do. But if they're really listening and the patient tells and, and the doctor allows that to happen, for the patient to tell a story, there will be something in that story that will jolt a doctor out of their medical regimen if they're, if they're doing what Rita Sharon says. And, and really listening, and then bringing it down to a less biomedical and a more common human interaction. So, okay, so then we get to the, the notion of co-constructing a coherent healing narrative that both people are contributing to. So, this slide comes from Arthur Kleinman's way of conceptualizing, and again, I think it's another way of talking about the voice of the life world and the voice of medicine. Doctors tell stories of disease, and by disease, he means where there's a set of symptoms, and usually um, they are verifiable in some way. So we go have a lab test done, and they're looking at what's in our blood or in our urine, or we may have an x-ray or an MRI. But they're looking for some way to confirm what they think might be wrong with the patient. Um, and when, they're, when a patient has something that's not confirmable that way, um, like chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, or some of these other things that for doctors seem kind of vague, and some doctors are actually doubtful that the patient is really suffering the way the patient feels that they're suffering because they can't confirm it in an observable or measurable kind of way. But that's the way they're trained. Um, patients tell stories of illness, 
and in common language we might use disease and illness as interchangeable, but in Kleinman's nomenclature they're different things. So illness is the experience of feeling not well. It's whatever we experience and we're not aware of whether, you know, there's too many white blood cells um, on an analysis or, um, you know, if there's some kind of obstruction in your bowel that, that you can see on x-ray, but you know you're not feeling well, whether it's verifiable or not. Um, and those two ideas sometimes go past one another. Um, <clears throat> Each person incorporates either implicitly or explicitly an explanatory model. Mm -hmm. And I think I mentioned this briefly last week when I talked about Gina, but the explanatory model, and Kleinman has eight questions that he uses to elicit an explanatory model. And they're pretty simple questions, but it's like, what do you think is wrong? What do you think is wrong? What, what do you think could help what's wrong? Um, how do you think this is going to progress? How is this um, affecting your everyday life? Questions like that. And it's, it's either the provider's or patient's way of explaining um, whatever the problem that the patient has come in with. Um, now, doctors don't think they're telling an explanatory model. They think that they're saying <laughs> precisely what's wrong. But, um, and sometimes they are. But nonetheless, it's, um, it's, it's the, a way of explaining that they're trained to do. Um, so I'm really curious to read the Straight Times because um, I would think that a traditional Chinese doctor's explanatory model of what's wrong with a patient um, might sound very different than a biomedical doctor's explanation. And they're both highly trained, um, but they have different kind of categories in their heads. And then the patient themselves may have a third way of explaining what's wrong. So the problem in communication comes either when those explanatory models aren't made um, explicitly so that each person is operating under a different explanatory model in their heads, but they haven't really stated it out loud or sometimes the patient does try and state their explanatory model and isn't listened to very well, or even worse, the doctor may not acknowledge it well or make them feel like this is an, a legitimate way of talking about whatever the problem is. So Kleinman says it's really important that you make those explanatory models explicit, that you get them out on the table, and at least that way you can see what the differences are between what the patient is thinking, what the doctor is thinking, um, and some of that may need to be negotiated. So if the patient wants to do something for themselves that isn't usually sanctioned by the doctor, the doctor may need to negotiate um, and make the, in order for the patient to feel legitimized and to want to continue seeing that practitioner. Um, behind those explanatory models are values and priorities um, that may be quite different. And then there are styles of telling each story and as we talked about yesterday doctors tend to be more in an accounting um, kind of mode of telling they're giving the official 
explanation uh, from a medical point of view of what they think is wrong. Patients tend to recount, um, and this is why doctors get impatient with their style of history taking, because they may bring up a lot of um, stories, they may reach far back in their memories uh, in order to recount what they think has happened that has led up to the current problem. And so those styles of telling may be very different. And then what you read today, um, the notion of building a history together, co-constructing, rather than simply doctor active, patient passive, swooping in and taking that history from the patient. Um, Kleinman, and then we're going to be reading Arthur Frank as well, uh, put big emphasis on listening with the intent of really taking in and witnessing patient suffering to really understand that. And that's very different than critical listening, <clears throat> where we're listening for certain things, we discard certain things if they don't fit with what our focus is. Um, and we know from, I think, being academics, we're very good at critical listening. That's what we've been trained to do. And that's, so yeah, and doctors are as well. So to get out of that mode and really be an empathic listening takes effort. <laughs> um, you'll see a lot of the second point in Arthur Frank's work appreciating embodiment in storytelling, that bodies themselves are texts to be read. And this includes nonverbal communication that goes along with verbal communication. Um, I've referred several times to Mattingly's notion of uh, the implotment and figuring out what story you're in when um, something ruptures your life and that's often the case um, in a medical context with not feeling well. Um, and then these things get written down in the chart. <laughs> and you don't get to see your chart as a patient, right? Uh, but it's there, and all the providers who attend to you, they're reading it and they're writing in it. And you'd be surprised what they're writing about <laughs> you. Uh, so the patient's voice in the chart is totally missing, but all the things that have been written about them over whatever the history is, is there and gets reified. Um, in terms of who you are as a person for the next provider who sees you. That chart follows you around. Um, I think this assumption about health and healing is a larger notion. Um, doctors are trained to to think about pathology um, and what's wrong with you and getting the larger context of who you are as a person in the context of your whole life and the fact that you might be having this particular problem but it's certainly not the only thing going on in your whole in your life and getting that fuller context um, is more an attitude of, of thinking about health and healing rather than just fixing a problem. Taking into account environmental, familial, cultural, financial. So yesterday when I mentioned trying to teach doctors a biopsychosocial, um, and some people would add spiritual, um, way of thinking to the regular biomedical kind of focus is a big leap um, because it, it's it's hard for them to encompass all of that in their thinking.
and so what are the best possible outcomes given the circumstances you have to, the provider needs to understand what those circumstances are. So that's kind of in a nutshell, a lot of ideas, and what I would like for us to do, um, and it, by the way, I, when we segue into the second half of this, and we're talking about research interviewing, I'm not saying doctors' jobs and your jobs as researchers are the same thing by a long shot, but I do think there's a certain analogy that as researchers, we're kind of sometimes stuck on critical thinking, that we have particular focuses, that we have a, um, an interview schedule that we think we need to accomplish and that may be very different than what's going on with your interviewees and participants in the field that you encounter. So it, it may seem kind of distant to you, but I think some of what we're talking about with provider-patient communication can be analogized with some of the problems we run into with research interview. So what I would like to do is to show you a, a tape that was made a while ago, um, and this was as part of training um, residents to be better communicators. Um, we videotape them with patients and then we go over and we do videotape review with the residents. So the doctor you're going to see is a fourth year resident. So he's almost ready to graduate. Um, be a full-fledged doctor, licensed doctor. Um, and this is one of his patients that he's seen several times before in the family practice clinic. Now, I'm a little nervous about showing you this tape because it's going to be hard for you to just understand um, the patient, not because of what he's saying, but how he's saying it. The patient is an African-American patient. Um, this was done in Chicago when I lived in Chicago. The patient came from Mississippi, which is one of the most southern states in the United States. And there's a very particular kind of accent um, that comes from living in the Deep South, and particularly among an African-American population. So when I've shown this tape before, even for um, classes in the U.S., people have a hard time, if they're from the North in the U.S., understanding the patient, both because of his accent, but there's also particular things that he says. For example, he'll ask the doctor, I'll give this one away, what makes a person so greedy? And uh, that has a particular meaning for that patient. It's really in the context of his diet because the doctor is, as you'll see, telling him to lose weight, and he probably has a big appetite. And so that's his way of phrasing that, what makes a person so greedy um, to his doctor. So there's little things like that. Um, if you want uh, us to stop the can we can do that on here, right? Um, if, if there's something that you hear that you'd like to hear again because you're, you're not getting it, or I may be able to translate just because I've heard this tape many times, um, you know, just raise your hand and, and say that because I am a little afraid this is going to be difficult for you to understand. Um, here's what I'd like you to do. We're going to watch the first 15 minutes of the interview because this was done in a training environment. They went way over 18 minutes because the students are allowed to take more time. So we're going to cut it off at the point where the doctor does the physical exam. We're just going to hear the first part and that takes about 15, maybe 20 minutes. What I'd like you to do and I'm going to have to tell you what happens at the very end because this goes on for some time and we won't, probably can't reach the end of the, the interview quickly. Um, but I'm just going to divide the table in half. So 
starting with Mary and over. Um, and this half of the table, your job at the end is to say, um, how would the doctor um, give a summary of what happened with this patient to their attending physician or to a fellow resident? What, what would the resident say about this interview? On this side of the room, your job is to, the, the patient tells us that he has an, a, a, an adult son living with him at home. Um, your job is to summarize how would the patient tell his son or maybe a neighbor um, what happened when he went to the doctor today, okay? So you're doing the patient's story, you're doing the doctor's story. And with that, we'll start. You know, coming, going forward. <laughs> okay, let's talk about you now. Um, how are you feeling? Well, it's, you know, I feel pretty good. Yes, I feel sorry, a little bit nervy still. And then I got these little boots on. You feel like they weigh 200 pounds. It's a few hundred pounds. Yeah. Ooh, my ladies, they feel so stiff, you know. But you know what I want to hit you with right off the bat? Uh, is the fact that maybe you don't weigh, maybe they don't weigh 200 pounds each, but you did gain 17 pounds on me? Since I, I did it since the last time? Uh huh. I went back up. You, you, you shot, you, you impressed me. I was real impressed yeah. by your weight loss. So yeah. why I guess, uh, I guess I'm sitting now eating because when we're getting out like a minimal uh, exercise. Hibernating. What not, see, I figure that. You know, I feel it too. Yeah. Yeah, I feel it. I believe that. You're right. Oh, I don't see it. And right now I'm hungry. I didn't eat nothing this month. <laughs> I'm going to feel Just like so it. Just so it's easy to get the scale down or something? Yeah, I don't know. Well, yeah, that's a real concern of mine. Now, we've we've talked before about your weight having a lot to do with your stiffness and your aches. Now, I, and I really do believe some. I believe that is portion of you know part of it, right? Yeah, I'm not saying it's all of it. No, no. I, have, uh, um, I don't know what. Part. <laughs> well, the other part probably is the fact that you had surgery back then, okay? Mm -hmm. And the surgery, whenever you start fooling around with the bones and the joints, just like if you're in high school football, if you get an injury to your neck or your shoulder, it always seems to act up oh, later on in the winter, so, yes. in, and in the humid weather. So, the weight is one part of it, and that's the only part that we can change, because the other part we can't change. No, no. You know, the arthritis in your back, it, 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 you know, it had to get the column and it come itself naturally, you know, right. or something like that, you know. I believe that, you know. Okay. So, now, where did we go wrong? You just felt like you were, it's getting cold and you just started hanging out in the house? And oh, yeah, I haven't been, you know, exercised, like I've been out, you know, yeah. and uh, what well, well, a couple of times around the block, you know. Mm -hmm. and I, I was feeling pretty good. I was feeling pretty good. I can tell it in a few pounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm telling you. By moving, you know, I, I feel like I move, you know. Okay. Uh, well, what are you going to do, huh? Now, though, that's the big issue with you. As I look at your chart, you know, essentially, that's the big thing that we need to work on. Now you started that diet. I'd like you to. I'd like you to try to. You know the reason I wrote. I wrote in my note that you lost 14 pounds because of starting this new diet that we put you on. Mm -hmm. If you could go back to that diet, it seems like it worked. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have to. I have no other choice. Mm -hmm. But you know. Uh, this place is being so greedy. <laughs> I know I got to eat if I take this medicine. I what makes a person it. so greedy? Being so greedy. Huh. You know, I, it just, <laughs> just having that hungry something. I, yeah. 
Yeah, but uh, I don't know. Ain't, ain't as bad for the weight of people I have seen. You know, a lot, mm -hmm. a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, I don't know that it's greedy. Maybe we could use another word. What makes people have to continually feel like they have to eat? Maybe that's. It's not greedy. I understand what you're saying. Um, different people for different reasons. Some people um, have too many things going on in their life. Some people, you know, and, and they eat. Uh, I think, I think I all about uh, those uh, things about uh, a person uh, getting a little memo about <laughs> something, you know, words or, or something like that about mm -hmm. things, you know. Mm -hmm. I think about it, you know, and I think. I ask myself sometimes, I say, you ain't, you ain't slipping, you ain't getting <laughs> crazy. Yeah. No, I don't, yeah. I don't think you're crazy. No, uh, but uh, you know, just like uh, uh, people's talk, all, all people's, you know, you know, a minute a person, if he walk out in front of a car or something like that, first thing you want to ask, would he worry about anything, you know? Mm. Or, or, or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Well, what, yeah. what do you do, what's going on at home? Are you by yourself? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh-huh. You got some friends? I mean, I'm not by myself. But, you don't uh, live alone? No, I, uh, my son lives there. He lives with you? And my, uh, uh, with my wife, oh, okay. she, I, you know, she helped me, you know, after she, she passed. When did she pass? She passed about two months ago now. No, I didn't know she that. She's in the hospital. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And, uh, yeah, it's just like, Sick, uh, un unusually, you know, she never did give up on nothing, and, yeah. didn't, and didn't, compl didn't give a complaint to nobody, you know. Mm -hmm. now, she was sick uh, when I came in the hospital for surgery, I guess, you know. You know but I couldn't tell it, and I, and I asked her at the time, I said, What is it? I said, You, what is your, what your complaint? You, you mm -hmm. had complaints, and you don't say nothing, tell me, or nothing. Nothing about. It. I knew a doctor asked her out here. He asked her, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when the last time she had an X-ray. See, mm -hmm. and oh man, she had had an X-ray for a long time. Yeah. And he told us that she she would have kept that up. See, cause she came out here and she had a a which take a lump. Yeah. And her breast. And yeah, and, and she ain't come back no more for oh, X-ray right. and all that stuff. You know. Yeah. And he told us you're supposed to continue to clean it. And take this x ray and notice yourself, see. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, and, you know, that. Uh, so you tried to help her. You tried to remind her to go, but she just. Well, I was, uh, you know, in fact, then she had got sick then, see. Yeah. Then I asked about, uh, had she been, you know, uh, in a bad way, you know, and mm -hmm. then come to that scared, go to the doctor. She wouldn't go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Uh, she go to church though. She never miss going to church. I see her felt so bad mm. to, and she go there and read the Bible and, and go in the room there and, and come out dressed. Very good church. Yeah. Mm. That's a little boy. Are, are you a church goer? Or have you been going since uh, your wife died? Yes. Yes. I I, go, I went uh, to this last weather got so cold. Yeah. And sure. I, I sure. Did. I went time. I ain't went down a couple Sundays. See, yeah. To church. Yeah. Have you been finding that the people there are able to help you out when, you know, do they know that your wife died and they kind of... Oh, yeah. That, that's the funeral at the church. It is? Yeah. Ooh, okay. Ooh, she's everybody. Everybody knows her. Everybody she's, knows her. What about you? Do they know you? She's a, what you call it, a, 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 a in church she was a... Deaconess? Uh, no, no, not a deacon. What you call the other one is a... Uh, uh, an elder? A deaconess? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of it. <laughs> no, I think of it. But anyway, she was the she was president a of, over uh, Ocean Church, you know. Okay. And now uh, everybody knows she come out, she come out the hospital with mm -hmm. busy people and all that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She had to uh, commit, you know. Yeah. Missionary. Yeah. I said she was a missionary. Missionary. Wow. Yeah. So how have you been able to sleep well? No. No? No. Since she died? And not even before she died. Before she died. I mean, as I said, uh, that was my, my problem was, uh, you know, uh, funny thing, I can lay down. Mm -hmm. And I can go to sleep. Mm -hmm. But I wake up, and I wake up aching. My legs and everything aching for me. I'm here all down. 
you know. I had I tried to stay with it, you know. Anyway, I said, go sleep. I, I, I always was a, a, a sleeping head person. I slept, go to bed early, you know. And uh, so, yeah, and, uh, and I, uh, and now, every time I lay down about five minutes, I'm going to sleep. But when I wake up, boy, I'd be aching. I, I turn over from side to side, you know. Maybe this side, I, maybe to stop and turn mm -hmm. to the next side, you know, mm -hmm. and, and get it that way. Now, really, uh, I changed. I went and got a, a mattress from the bed. And, uh, and you know, that mattress, ain't two, ain't, it ain't two years old. And that mattress, I'm, I'm telling you, by me being weight, I guess, uh, I, paid, uh, I paid just about, I paid 180 some dollars for that mattress, you know. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. And, uh, and, uh, I didn't know it now, you know. Now I can't touch for my feet. I can't even touch metal with my feet. I get in bad You can't touch metal with my you know, feet. No, I can't. And I can touch it with my feet. Ooh, man. Look at that bite. Cold. Yeah, sharp. Sharp. Yeah, bite like, you know. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I can get them off of that, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what the, what. And I can't stand, I can't stand wool either. I got these wool pants on here, and this some what help make me ache right now. That's what I've got to get out of this this stuff. Get kite. Yeah, see them underneath your pants. You have wool pants on, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, they get itch sometimes. Yeah, but I can't stand. I can't stand to touch no kind of milk from here down. Mm -hmm. On the right side only. Both sides. Both sides. And that's been since your operation? Yeah. I couldn't even put, when I was in the hospital here, I couldn't put the wool blanket on my bed. Mm -hmm. They had to roll up and I let it stay rolled up down the foot of me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, sometimes that can happen from the, I don't know if the neurosurgeons have spoken to you about this, but sometimes that can happen as a result of the, of the operation. You can get what we call, uh, is that's, is that's electricity or something like that? Yeah, well, you know what, they operated around your nerves, you know? And, and the nerves were cut upon, not cut upon, but maybe irritated, and there's inflammation in the area, and you know, it, it can cause funny feelings in your legs like that. But do they know that? They, I'm sure they've known about it. No, since I've been, they might not have been able to do anything. They might not. When I've been coming back with treatment, do you know I haven't, I haven't mentioned that part. One thing I say, I'm still, and it's swell. My leg, you know, I told you, my leg swell. Sure. And uh, and, and like that, you know. But I never mentioned about it. I, I was being intended to, but I, somehow I, you know, I, I never said that the one that ill, this, some of this could have came by mm -hmm. uh, that, the, the operation, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they, see, I was on the machines, uh, 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 that, what you call them, uh, which, and that's was kind of giving me fits in the BAD. Mm -hmm. You know? The ten Ooh, I was so glad when he got took them, that stuff off of me. I'm not sure which treatment that you had. That, that uh, no, 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 no machine that they, they can look at the and tell if we're moving or if anything uh, function mm. in the hospital, you know. Okay. They got them on horse all the machines like that. They hook you up, you know. Mm. And they cause your muscles yeah. to move? Yeah, I can tell the difference in that twist too. I mm. act like big mess even time. Yeah. Hey, you take this off. So these things don't, don't move. I just trying to say, you know, Say they're coming loose, you know, because mm -hmm. it just sticks them out here, you know. Mm -hmm. And pop, the machine stop working, you're trying to get noise, you know. Okay. <laughs> kind of a monitor. Yeah. I don't like twist it. I just tell you. Why don't, why don't you, um, why don't we take a look at you a little bit, okay? Yeah, okay. And um, why don't you have a seat up here and take your shirt off, you know, just take your blood pressure and take it. Yeah, okay. And then I'll take your shoes off because I'm going to check your boot. All right. You made it? Uh, let's see. You, you want to okay, just down here? Well, actually, just this sweater. This sweater, and then maybe we can yeah. roll up the. Yeah. Uh, more is more is complete. Okay, let's go. Yeah. So the, the doctor knows he's being recorded? Oh, absolutely. But not this the is for their. Yes. Everybody has to give consent. So the patient knows as well? Yes. How long was that? How, how, long, long, how mm -hmm. long ago? No, I mean, how long was you doing? Uh, oh, it goes, probably goes for about 40 minutes. 
because there is a part after he does the physical oh. examination. Mm -hmm. There, is, there is other good stuff on here. It looks, like, it looks like about thirty minutes. This one was. It, can you fast forward and see if you can get past the physical Come. exam? It's about fifteen minutes. If you can do that, we'll play the ending. Just now, so it's 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking that it's already a little bit too long for the normal. But this is a training. This is to train the, the residents, so okay. it's different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Sam. Would you say that the um, pace and tone of the consultation was influenced by the facts that it was being recorded? No. So the doctor wasn't... They do this several times. This is part of their residency training. It just it seems very, he seems very patient. Yeah. Yeah. Asking him a lot of questions right. about his life. He's a nice he's guy. Did counseling, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, he's, he, I think <laughs> this, the resident <laughs> is a nice guy, but also he's been taught about biopsychosocial, so mm -hmm. I think he's really trying to do that. Mm -hmm. But why don't you guys have a quick consult with each other, and then I want to hear what the doctor's story is, what the patient's story is. So put your heads together quickly. Yeah, sorry. Although this wife, you know, the wife's death and stuff, it sometimes can be yeah, difficult, okay? That's very really, uh, are you using the, I'm sorry, are you using the colase? Well, the what? Colase. Yeah, sure. Uh, How many times a day are you using it? Uh, uh, three times. I think we can cut it. Three times a day. Okay, let's try and put into application uh, some of the concepts that I just talked about. What are the explanatory models that each of these people are using? I think the doctor is operating under... He's, he, he's accounting. Yeah. He's what? Some, he's trying to account for his weight gain. Yes. And all the stiffness and all the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And the patient is just trying to recount what's been happening the last two months. Okay, so there's definitely different styles, as nice as the doctor is. Yeah. But that's, that's not, that doesn't quite answer the question of what's the operating operant explanatory models. The doctor goes by like the psychological way, like make you try, I don't know, he's so understanding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we taught him behavioral science well, so good. But, but, but really, you know, like here's my number, call me anytime. Wow. But, oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, what a good doctor he is. Well, you know, this was a number of years ago. I have doctors now that I can email. I can send messages to, mm -hmm. and they'll reply. Not every one of my doctors, but yeah. Yeah. that's even, not uncommon. Even here, the usual thing when you go to a doctor, there's an email, mm -hmm. you usually get an email. Mm -hmm. from the, from the yeah, there's this really cool new charting system that a couple of the doctors I see are using called MyChart, and um, I get downloaded the results of any lab tests that I've done, um, any x-rays, everything, not the doctor's chart notes, I don't see that, but any tests are all there for me to see, and if I have a message that I want to send to the doctor, I can do that, and then usually get a response within a day. It's, it's, it's really pretty neat. But anyhow, I still haven't heard an answer to my question because the explanatory models are really important um, in terms of what's going on here. 
kind of my observation is that when the patient tries to you know, provide his narratives, everything links together. Right? So it is not just about weight gain or weight loss, but it's like linked to my everyday life experiences. You know, you know, my, my wife passed away, I couldn't sleep. Oh, my leg you know, got all this pain. So everything linked together. It's not like, and then, you know, talks about, um, you know, my, my feeling about what this greeting means and then, you know, uh, what I observe, you know, how other people in my community means. So from the patient's perspective, it is, everything just linked together and then it's not my, it, it's not my responsibility to cut, you know, everything you know, into different areas yes. where I describe, yes. you know, the bio, way, psycho, why, social. Why, why. <laughs> it's not my, it's really not my, my obligation. So when I provide my narratives, I just give you the whole thing. If you allow me to have this kind of space to provide my narratives, then this is how I describe, you know, the whole issue that, you know, surrounding around the issue of weight loss or weight gain or, you know, weight uh, uh, management. But then if you look at the, uh, the doctor's perspective, then it is really about, okay, what are the underlying reasons? This is, uh, uh, this is the problem, and this uh, should be the right treatment, but the uh, lack of you know, uh, compliance, what would be the reason that can account for those reasons? What are other you know, background factors that can you know, explain this kind of you know, reasons? And then therefore, we should pay attention to what other issues when I give you, you know, more you know, uh, health advice and then even so a very patients. rational right. but compartmentalized right. way of thinking. Right. Um, about what's the patient's explanatory model? Actually, towards the end, I, I kind of think it became more consumerist in the sense that he began asking for medication. Like, I spent my time here, you looked at me, you gave me my medication, I've given you my story, give me back my yeah. prescription. You know, he was asking for a pipe. Specific yeah, th there's another drugs. remark that we I didn't want to like spend time getting to the end, but the doctor gives him a slip to say, come back in three months, we'll have another visit. And he says, why so long, doc? And so mm -hmm. the doctor says, okay, two months. <laughs> so yes, there is a bit of that. I think, although I don't, I wouldn't say this patient feels like they have the upper hand mm -hmm. in this, but there is a bit of that. I, I feel like I'm at a, at a loss in the sense that it's not a typical fit in any of those, those brackets. Um, it's not like a traditional, you know, I have the power because he's clearly making, you know, listening and kind of you know, trying to get to the narratives. But there isn't also this, like, um, from the patient, a consumer, doctor, you know, I just, you know, um, you are from the yeah. point, but then this isn't really truly collaborative because the doctor hasn't moved away from what needs to be done and what he needs to prescribe and what need. So the, just I feel like there's elements of everything, mm -hmm. but there isn't. And so it, it doesn't quite yeah, come together. It doesn't come so. Mm -hmm. so I don't know. There's a little like, bit of that. I mean, in the beginning he was saying like, I can't be there all the time. You know, he's admitting he's not you know, able to give all the answers, you have to take care of yourself at some point in time, you know, work with me. Kind and of I think the patient's not quite ready to take on that responsibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm thinking that uh, some of the key elements, uh, maybe key, maybe only to me, that uh, the doctors should have asked, but uh, didn't ask. For example, they uh, lose weight, what kind of activities you have been engaged with, and then the, uh, towards the latter part of the conversation, it goes, you know, whatever you have been doing, just continue to do that. But then for me, I was asking uh, what exactly have you been doing, what time? And then that kind of conversation, I think that should happen earlier in the uh, conversation. And also there, this wife passing, I noticed that the doc doctor was kind of like stick with this fact. Yes. Although the yes. patient says that, uh, you know, this pain and wake up uh, at night happened before my wife passing. But then this doctor seems to have already recognized it as the cause of uh, uh, weight uh, management or whatever. So he's constantly getting back to that. Yeah, get yeah. back to that. So I'm kind of thinking that it's true that the doctor wanted to find the real causes of the current condition of this patient. Mm. But then, 
you know, there's certain gaps. Uh, there were certain gaps that uh, he needed to get the answers from the patient in order to fill it, mm -hmm. to, to decide whether like it what is if you actual were, If cost. you were advising, if you were doing a videotape review, which is what we, why we videotape this, in order to teach the resident, what, what would you advise? What are the gaps that you would try and point out to the resident? Resident? The doctor. Ah, oh, the doctor. Uh -huh. I would consider that uh, in terms of um, in terms of stiffness, pain, obviously this doctor identified it as not the major stay of this yeah. visit. Yes. But if I was the doctor, I would say that okay, uh, let's hear the story or even more about the story, and then I'll, I'm going to you know see what 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 else we can do. But. Do not directly shut this off, saying that uh, you know we can do nothing about that. Or even if I, as the doctor, cannot do anything, I can refer you to some alternative mm -hmm. treatment, like uh, go to a Chinese doctor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. get some massage, mm -hmm. play some yoga or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at least refer to something, channel it out, channel it, the acknowledge it. Yeah, yeah, acknowledge it yeah. and accept it and then channel it. If you cannot handle it, there's some way that some people, some, some um, other people can handle it. Mm -hmm. So refer to some, yeah, do not just uh, say, this is a dead, dead alley. Uh, we are not going to talk about it anymore. So I found that. Yeah. I, that's good. I detected that as well. Uh, uh, like there was, it felt like, he was trying his best to empathize, but it felt uncomfortable. At least that's what I read from him, that it got a bit awkward. And you could see instances in his conversation where he tried to um, distance himself or tried to take that objective position again. I'm what, what would be an example of that? Well, like, at the end, maybe it's a slip, but you know, we don't believe in slips in narratives, yeah. but he was saying, um, the wife's death, not your wife's death. Yeah. Or stay away from the table, chief. Yeah. Did you did you <laughs> yeah. get that? Yeah. That's not usually, you know, language between doctor and patient, and and he's a much younger man than the mm -hmm. patient is. Yes. He's oh. trying, but you know. Also, often when I step into you know a, a room in a hospital. I feel that I'm in a field where I do not know the direction. I need constant direction from the doctor, as if I'm the student driver or something like that. And I really appreciate, you know, when I and my wife went to, you know, their check and then they, uh, they say that I'm going to put some jelly on your belly, so it's mm -hmm. for the uh, baby ultrasound. And then you said you might feel a little bit cool, but it's okay and then something like that. Then this doctor says, uh, okay, I'm going to give you the prescription, but doesn't come to the conclusion that what kind of problem is that. And then, so I don't think it's a nice way of guiding you. Through, but it could just be me, I'm very okay. critical. So the patient might have needed more direct guidance yes. in, in how to achieve yeah, and a conclusive remarks. Right. Well, what I found interesting was that even though he jumped on the diet and then he realized that his wife had died, he didn't sort of connect the wife's death to the diet. When actually he could have asked him and probed him a little bit more about whether his eating patterns have changed now that his wife, whom I presume was a primary provider in the home of, you know, Food, food, yeah, um, and how how he was taking care of his own dietary needs now that his wife had passed. That's yeah, I think that was probably in the because it kind of comes up coincidentally that the wife died. Um, that this isn't something that the patient brought to the conversation, but they and and that was a good question on behalf of the doctor. Um, you know, who, who do you live with, what's, what's happening at home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think he was in his head thinking what could have accounted for this guy going off his diet. Mm -hmm. And then the patient volunteers, my wife passed. Um, 
And I think probably the resume that Dr. was making that connection, but you're right that it doesn't get articulated. Um, I, what, I, there, okay, so there are certain topics that are out there, okay? There, Sarah, you want to say something else? Oh, it's yeah, just a little bit connected. Um, I was really surprised the main thing that he didn't ask was specifically, I know he's not a nutritionist, but when he said, oh, everything I eat is probably fatty foods or something like that. It's fattening. Or it's fattening. It's fattening. I was surprised he didn't say, okay, let's talk about some, like, some things you can eat or what are some More things you can do to change uh -huh. or why is it hard for you to stay on this diet? Is it that, like, one thing, if he's very involved with church and people are bringing meals over, which I assume is probably the case, you know, what is what is it that's changed? Is it in connection with his wife's death? Or is it just his eating patterns that he is upset and so he's eating fatty foods or he doesn't know what some good foods are to eat? So I was surprised you didn't explore and ask him, like, why is it difficult for you to stay on the diet? Or what is your idea of what is something that you can eat to change? Who's doing the cooking now? Right. If he knows that food, if he identified in the beginning, okay, I can't help the leg. The diet or exercise is what I can do. I was surprised he didn't do delve more, more into like that. some operational things he can do at the end. I, I, mean, I think it kind of became social psychological for the sake of social psychological, rather than pulling out stuff from there to feed into the biomedical part. Because finally, that's the takeaway I think the patient needs to get take away from the uh, from the interview that these factors in my life are affecting my health in such and such way, and this is how I can control that. Whether it is um, the, the stuff on the menu before or after the wife's death, or lack of sleep, or whatever, but you know, like Sarah and uh, some of the said, I think that connection is probably not as robust as it could yeah. be. Yeah, because I don't think any of us are convinced that the next time he comes back, he's going to have lost weight. Right. So, as nice as this resident is, I'm, I'm sorry, I keep calling him a resident because he's a resident doctor. He's still in training. As nice as this doctor is, um, yeah, he's not as, a, this isn't as effective an interaction uh, as we would hope. I do think there's a whole, so I think there's certain topics that are out there that they're both discussing like we both understand each other there's my legs hurt there's and I'm stiff um, ever since I had this operation there's I need to lose weight there's and by the way my wife died and there's something and I, and I think I don't know where it is in the tape I haven't watched this tape for a while but at the end, he, but I think this isn't the first time it comes up in the conversation. And I don't know if you could make that out, but he's saying, I really want to be active. I want to be doing work. And the resident, and, I, and by the way, I'm not so sure this guy is big on church. That mm -hmm. is something the, re, the doctor the brings to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I, I, I know from my partner <laughs> that I worked with uh, who's did who taught behavioral science to these medical residents that this is a religious doctor. So the patient says, everybody at church knew my wife and she was really active. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that he is. And mm -hmm. so when he says, I want to do work and I want to be exercising, which I guess is hard for him, he's with a cane after his, his surgery. And the resident starts talking about, well, you can volunteer at church. I'm not too convinced that that was this, this guy's thing. Mm -hmm. But there, there is another part that I'm sorry we didn't hear, and I'm not sure where it is on the tape, which is, um, Mary, you picked up that he said, what, I'm feeling kind of crazy. He mentions yeah. that he, he's feeling a little crazy. And yeah. 
it doesn't really get... He says he doesn't think the patient... Yeah, the patient says, I, I think I'm going crazy. But the doctor says he doesn't... Yeah, think. he doesn't really deal with that or pick up on that. And it comes... The word crazy comes up a second time where he complains about not working. This is a man who mm. wants a job. Oh. He wants to be moving. He probably wants to get paid. Uh, I don't think he's looking to do volunteer work in the church. Um, so, okay, so there's that. So there's these topics where ostensibly they're talking about the same thing and they kind of understand each other. But if we were to prioritize what's important to each person, mm -hmm. how would those priorities look? What would the patient prioritize first? What would be at the top of his list? His pain. His pain. Okay. Did that get addressed? Okay. For the doctor, clearly it's weight loss. Um, what would be the next priority after weight loss for the? You said his stiffness. I'm not. I'm not sure that would be the next priority. Well. Grief management. Grief management. Mm -hmm. I think the mm -hmm. the doctor was very attentive to the fact that his his wife died, mm -hmm. um, and I think his pain and his discomfort would be at the bottom because mm -hmm. the doctor says there's not much we can do about that. He mm -hmm. says that right at the top, and in fact, how does the how does the conversation begin? Can you remember back to the beginning? The patient sticking out his leg, and he says it feels like it weighs 200, 200 pounds, pounds, and then really stiff. Yeah. Um, and immediately, the doctor says, "I don't know what we can do about that, but you, you've gained all this weight." <laughs> yeah. So there's an immediate shift yes. in the conversation to to what the doctor feels. And to be fair, that's what he feels like he can do something about. But it. We, he mishlered him. <laughs> he totally <laughs> cut off um, that part. And then when I, I've been kind of hammering away at the side of the table about what's the explanatory model, and you may not have been able to understand or hear that very well, but I think that the patient has a very elaborate explanatory model that, has, that I don't quite understand, but it has something to do with electricity. I feel shocky, I feel nervy, um, and I can't touch water, and I can't stand wool. And they hooked me up to these machines that went, mm -hmm. and ever since then, I've been, their electricity went through me. And they're saying, he, he, I think he has a pretty elaborate kind of idea of what's wrong, and it may or may not be right, but it doesn't get acknowledged very well. And I think until that gets acknowledged, I'm not sure they're going to make much headway on the diet thing. He, he agrees with the doctor that he needs to lose weight. He likes this doctor. He wants to come back in two months rather than three months. Um, so there's a lot of positive things going on. But I think you all have picked up on it. This change isn't going to happen until certain things happen, that you get more explicit about the foods, that you find out who's cooking in the house, but also that you pay some attention to the main reason this patient came. He didn't come in for losing weight. He came in because the pain. So, so can, can we see that explanatory model for the doctor is problem, solution, Except that this problem is defined by the doctor, who's just so obsessed with weight loss. You know, I mean, it's problem solution, but it's problem the way I see it to be. So, the doctor sees it to be. Yes, and and I mean, we go to doctors yeah. to get their expert opinion. I don't think this doctor is yeah. way off the, you know. This man does need to lose weight, and it may have something to do with the pain in his legs that he's carrying this much weight. So it, it's not that the doctor is wrong, but is it collaborative? Yeah. It kind of has a veneer of collaboration, but not really an engagement in a way that might be more effective. 
it just sorry, made me think when you were um, you know, when you were explaining just now uh, doing a health harm project and you go into a rural context and say okay, uh, clean drinking water, boil your water, and then they tell you fix my road first, and then yes. you don't see the connection, but actually it's the road that prevents them maybe to get to that place. And I just feel like this is what's happening. In the, you know, just, I have a and you know, this is what you need to do to fix it, but then to get there, it, it's like you know, they're not uh, maybe losing that weight unless what he thinks is the issue is actually addressed, and which is the pain and the uh, you know, all the electricity or how it is. And I think Kong is right that it, he, this doctor, doesn't have the capacity to change that, but, but to acknowledge it and maybe make a, a yes. referral. He says, did you talk to the neurosurgeons about that? And the, the patient says, well, I meant to, but I didn't. You know, what I said about question a asking. Um, so maybe this doctor could be his advocate and make that link for him. Because um, I just don't think there's going to be any change until that happens. But so it's, yeah, there are power issues in that, right? Because he's more like a general practitioner. And then for him to refer the doctor, the, the patient uh -huh. to a neurosurgeon with what seems to be the patient's um, neurosis about his condition, the doctor might think, you know, I, I probably shouldn't do that. He'll probably err on the side of caution. I don't know. I mean, that's hypothesizing yeah, a lot. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know about that, but I think... So you're saying because he's a family doctor, he doesn't have the power to get to the neurosurgeon? Or, or he doesn't feel that the condition necessarily warrants attention. Well, I think that's more the issue, yeah. that he doesn't feel it warrants it. But, you know, just saying to the patient, did you talk to the neurosurgeon about that? Um, he might have to facilitate that. Um, the family doctor is supposed to be the coordinator, he's your primary care, he's supposed to be the coordinator of your care. It doesn't always work that way, but um, I think not giving any credence, I mean, you called it a neurosis. Um, I don't know that it's a neurosis. He's, he, he has pain. I mean, maybe acupuncture would help with that or something, or massage or something. Um, the Western trained doctors are not apt to be thinking that way, but not to acknowledge it at all or to write it off as, the, you know, if you're saying it's a neurosis, you're saying there's not really something there and you're being... Well, that, that was the thing that I was yeah. getting from the doctor because also partly the kind of language oh, that the patient yeah, was yeah. using, you know, like, oh... Okay, so I, that's not your judgment. Yeah, you no. think the doctor was making that judgment. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So my question is, in kind of wrapping this up, is um, if, you, if you were the communication specialist in this situation, reviewing the tape, we, we heard from Kung what his advice would be. What, is there any other piece of advice you'd want to tell this doctor in training? I feel like saying, don't ask if you're not if you're not really want to listen. I feel like he's asking because there's this um, training of by social included, but ah, it just can be so nice. And we we let's well, move back to fast the fact that he's nice and he's giving this time and he's listening. But I really felt like we he's stuck in this critical listening mode where he's listening for certain things and he's not really listening to the. Uh, to the patients, like, you know, one, you have to listen to listen, and two, don't ask if you don't want to really, if you're going to brush it. It was, it was a frustrating conversation. <laughs> I just, I think, I, uh, for me, I just didn't feel like it, it really achieved a purpose. All the time that was yeah, spent. Yeah, all, all the time that was spent. Uh -huh. What else? I think it's the same thing I said before, that the um, social psychology has to feed back into the biomedical so that he could have asked or looked for um, specific reasons in the man's context that he could have then tied back. That could have made the entire interview more holistic, more comprehensive, and I think therefore more effective. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, your name is Ali and um, So you were the one that said, well, in the patient's story, it all linked together. Um, 
So how, how would you get the doctor to recognize those linkages? Because that's what really you're talking about. I thought I just had an idea for this. <laughs> Are there questions he could that the doctor could ask that would make that a more coherent story? I think it can probably focus a little more. I think he was on the right track. For instance, when he said my wife passed away, I think he did say something to the effect of food. I don't remember, but if he had continued on that track and said, oh, so who used to cook at home and now he yeah. does. Yeah. And if he had gone that track, um, so, so probe more la, probe la. Probe with the eye on identifying uh, factors that can affect what the man has come there for. I mean, which, which, becomes, which comes back to what's the objective of this whole interview, right? So ask questions that will give him insights from the broader context, but which can inform what the objective of the whole meeting is about, so that it becomes more productive. Now I know what I want to say, because I suddenly got to I think, you know, it's good that the doctor really shows some support. I think that sometimes, you know, the patient wants that, okay, at least the doctor you know, shows some support, understand, you know, those, you know, uh, difficult, you know, moment in my life. So maybe that would be something being appreciated by the patient and also the, pa the patients that the doctor has, right? But the other interesting thing that I was thinking about is that anyway, the doctor will have this predetermined agenda there that is about, you know, weight management. So there's like the interesting thing I was like thinking about, you know, when Ganga was talking, I was like, okay, what would happen if that, you know, he still work around the predetermined agenda that he want to achieve, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know uh, the whole you know, uh, weight management uh, issue that, okay, I will still try to persuade the patients by all means that I would, you know, try to let the patients to know the importance of, you know, weight management and then I would try you know, all mm -hmm. kinds of approaches to persuade the, uh -huh. the, the, uh, the patient, right? Because from my perspective, although I want to be supportive, but I do have my, you know, uh, profession that, you know, this is my, this is my position and then I really need to, you know, stand on my ground and then to do whatever that I can do. So that would be like the, uh, the, 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 the the standpoint that we really need to hold. So then it would more about the strategies, the communication strategies and uh, that he can apply to kind of like persuade the patient. So I was like thinking about, okay, so you know, from, the, uh, from the doctor's perspective, it, it, it has to be like that or not. So I was like thinking about that. Okay, I've seen the question. Oh, no, I think persuasion is mm -hmm. in there, but I think there are some other things that if we go back to the difference between disease and illness, right. I think we're seeing that played out here. Yeah. Uh, the patient's experience versus what the doctor knows yeah. to be a problem. Um, and um, do you think they, in hated and patternities, terms, was this taking a history or was it building one? I think it's just more like building a story than building history. Oh, what's the distinction you're mm -hmm. making? <laughs> because he asked about the story and we got a life story, but by history I mean more related to the topic at hand. So he opened up the floor and the story flowed out. But what is the topic at hand? Um, See, yeah. that's what's said, that's what's contested. Things. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think he was attempting, I think he really was attempting to build one with the patient, but in the end, I don't think there was a coherent mm -hmm. narrative that was really co-constructed. Mm -hmm. They were kind of, kind of parallel and not coming together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think about uh, the uh, there is an article which is, you know, talks about the, we, how how easily we can change the direction of the conversation by simply asking a question, right? That, but then that doesn't necessarily mean that is what is important to the person communicating to us, and that's why right. we're about. trying to do our agenda, just yeah. like the doctor was. Mm -hmm. So that's a good segue. Let's take a little bit of a break and come back and let's talk about your field experiences with interviewing and 
what Lisa says about that. Mm -hmm. oh. Pretty well um, and gave you a lot of examples from her own work in India um, about um, the different things that the interviewer brings to field research um, that can make a difference um, in, in the data, really, um, and certainly how, in the meaning of the data, okay? Um, including even transcriptions, certainly translations, um, which is always problematic. So I was interested in hearing some of the experiences that you all are having with your own field research and um, if you had <laughs> if you had some uh, episodes in which you feel like <clears throat> either you <laughs> that you just want to share with us or if you'd like some advice on what's happening and you had your hand up already, right? Yeah. 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 Actually, you know, I and HRA did a study about the integrated medicine, how you know elderly uh, Chinese Singaporean women here they use both uh, TCM and the biomedicine mm -hmm. to you know, uh, you know, uh, maintain their uh, well-being. And then when we analyze the data, we did you know, uh, find some quotes, like they would tell, uh, they would tell us that, okay, they, this patient and this woman, they, they do perceive you know, um, tensions that occur at multiple levels. Like they observe the uh, conflicts between the biomedical system and the traditional Chinese medical system. They know that there exist some differences too. And then they know that you know, usually the uh, Western physicians wouldn't have any dialogue with the Chinese you know, practitioners. And then they observe. They also know that there is like a generation gap between themselves and their younger family members. So the data are very fascinating. But then when, you know, we as a researcher, when we come to our conclusion, and then, you know, based on the findings that we found, and then, you know, participants are very frank. They say, they told, uh, they told us that, okay, uh, we try to explain, you know, our use of TCM to the Western physician. But they would just tell us that, okay, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. The Chinese medicine is going to do it, and then they don't know the side effect. Right. So according to the course, they would tell us that, okay, why bother? Because even if we do tell the Western physicians that we are going to use Chinese medicine mm -hmm. to achieve our body, this is what they are going to tell us. And then some of them tried, some of them they didn't. And then actually uh, they are facing some very serious illness. For example, you know, some uh, women, most of the women, they will have their direct family members died you know, uh, because of cancer. Mm -hmm. So one particular quote from one uh, uh, lady, her husband, you know, had lung cancer, and so uh, he went to, you know, chemo. Uh, and then, you know, they tried to explain to the Western physician that, okay, after the chemo, we are going to use TCM to clean his body. And then, of course, they, they, they did, you know, tell the Western physician that's what they are going to do. And, of course, you know that the doctor would, you know, respond pretty, you know, uh, 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 strongly to say, now, okay, you shouldn't do that because, you know, it's not good. So, and then, <laughs> but then in the interview, they said, yeah, but uh, my husband really didn't feel well. So after we told the Western physician, we just went to the Chinese you know, <laughs> practitioner and then we just, you know, you know, uh, exhale from the TCM doctor. And then after that, I don't know what the side effect would be, but obviously my husband feel better. So we guess, you know, it's effective. <laughs> and then, you know, when, you know, uh, during the interview, you know, of course we would probe and then say that, okay, what would be, what would the Chinese physician, uh, the TCM physician would say? And then they say, oh, of course we wouldn't tell, we wouldn't pass the Western physician's message to the Chinese doctor because we we know what the Chinese doctor would say. He would say, yeah, oh yeah, those Western physicians, they are so smart, so they will kill both the you know, good cells and the bad cells. So they are so clever, so they are just going to kill everything, right? So, and then they say, why bother? Because we do not want to get involved in this kind of debate that ourselves couldn't handle. So 
that's whatever you know that they're doing. Who said that? Uh, the patient. The patient. The said patient. That. That we okay. don't want to get into okay. the get into that kind of debate. Uh -huh. So you know we will just do whatever we think. So so what oh, is wow. the problem for the researcher? Then? For the researcher is that okay. So now we observe this kind of tensions here, and then we see that okay, women here they do have some enjoying some kind of autonomy in the decision making process. But then we also saw this kind of blind spot when they use the so-called you know, integrated medicine. But then, okay, so now we have to come to our conclusion part in our mm -hmm. research paper, and then we want to provide some practical suggestions because we still want our research to have some contribution, right? But then, okay, I found that it would be a little bit naive for me as a communication researcher to say, okay, we suggest that the physicians should have more dialogue with the patient. They should engage the patients more. And then we were like, okay, this kind of, you know, Conclusion is a little bit, you know, just naive because from the communication, you know, researchers' perspective, it's really not the, you know, this kind of suggestion is just like, okay, you just do that for lip service. Okay, everybody should talk more. But when we really, you know, see the data and then they will just tell you that. But the, that kind of uh, conflict exists between, you know, the, you know, the practitioners from two camps. Then, for what's the role for com researchers in this kind of you know uh, phenomena? Then you know, I really couldn't. For me, I really couldn't say, okay, all of you, you know, doctors, you should talk to each other, because that's not the thing that I I don't think if I really have that kind of skill. I well, wouldn't. I mean, it, I can't tell you what to do either, but I would go back to. What was your original research questions? Mm -hmm. What was it that you were mm -hmm. collecting these narratives right. to answer what questions? Originally, we wanted to find out, you know, it's more about, you know, find out and then to describe, to understand more about the phenomenon here. And then we were like, have this kind of presumption, we thought that, okay, for this, because we try to find those women with you know, low income and low educational level, mm -hmm. and then see how would they uh, navigate between these two systems, and then see, you know, Which it sounds like you did. You, right, you, right. So you're answering your research question. Right. To the degree that you get into recommendations, or I would call them implications, right, right. of what you're doing, I think it depends on where you plan to publish that and who you're addressing. So there, if it went into a healthcare journal, mm -hmm. sometimes they specify that they want you to have practical implications. Uh, for I don't know if this is a widely read journal here, but there's a journal that does publish um, a fair amount of uh, qualitative work called Patient Education and Counseling, mm -hmm. and they're very interested in communication mm -hmm. kinds of issues. And part of what that journal stipulates is that every article that um, is published in there has to have, not a big section, but a section at the end called implications, like practical implications. And if you were writing in a journal like that and you were addressing people who are in practice, then I think a recommendation like, or not necessarily a recommendation, but an implication that it might be more effective if Western doctors specifically asked what patients were doing or vice versa, um, the traditional Chinese medicine, um, that it would be in keeping with what the intent of that journal is. For a communication journal, probably not, because you're not talking to clinicians. So that, that would be my... Does hope that your uh, data can really have some kind of like contribution to help the reality, that sometimes you feel like, okay, a little bit frustrated, because after you reveal you know, the phenomenon, then how can you move one step further to help? Yeah, so um, again, it depends on who it is you want to share your information with, your study with, and I think if it's with clinicians, then that's appropriate. I, I'm curious as to, since we're talking about narrative, um, what your successes have been in collecting stories. 
And I ask that question because I often see this with my um, graduate students where they're doing qualitative work and they're asking open-ended questions, but they're not asking questions in a way that encourages people to really tell you their stories. Um, instead, they get a lot of kind of more abstract generalization kinds of things. Decontextualized information. Decontextualized. Um, and so then we have to go back and really see how they're asking those questions. So, um, or even how they have framed their research questions to begin with. Um, but so I'm wondering about what your experiences have been and if you feel like you've been pretty successful in a eliciting narrative kind of data that you can work with. It sounds like in your study there is that. Um, I think when I did my um, dissertation, which was on corporate social responsibility, my, one of my questions was to um, find out how senior leaders and business managers articulate their understanding of CSR in the Indian context. And so my opening question was usually very, very general. I just asked, uh, what according to you is CSR in the Indian context? I am not looking for a definition. Please explore it mm -hmm. it's allowed. But interestingly, I got I got beautiful long answers. Like usually this question would give me about 40 minutes of Mm, that's great. Yeah, and then I would have to mentally run to make sure that, you know, because most of my remaining questions would have already been answered. Mm -hmm. But there was one particular interview. He was the CEO, he was the founder, and I think the setting helped. He was not in his headquarters, he was traveling, and he happened to be in the city I was in. And we were in the lobby in a cafe in the hotel where he was staying, totally relaxed. No secretaries, no deadlines, no nothing. He gave me one and a half hours, and that was completely beautiful storytelling. So when I said this, he said, you know what? He reminded me of my uncle who often tells stories. I said, you know what? One day I was driving along when I saw this board, something for the elderly, and I thought, hmm, who in this age is interested in the elderly? And I stopped and I asked, Meanwhile, I'm getting a panic attack because I'm not sure where this is going, right? <laughs> and I don't know whether I'm getting the responses to my mm -hmm. questions, but of course I can't stop him. And I don't want to stop also because it's a beautiful story. And then he talks about how he set up this foundation which trains underprivileged people. And then when he went to a hotel, how this guy came up to him and said, Sir, do you remember me? So there's a lot of stuff coming out through his narratives, but it, was, it wasn't easy for me to put it in what is CSR, why is CSR, uh, benefits of CSR, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. in the boxes. Mm -hmm. so, so you're kind of like in the position of the physician who has some things they've <laughs> got to get to, and um, get this guy is a storyteller, <laughs> but kind of yeah. you're thinking off topic. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I was uh, say I, I guess I take uh, the opposite uh, uh, position, and then why I probably find that uh, interview frustrating is because uh, I have my research question, but whenever I go to an interview, I never go in with an objective to get a certain response. I really is about whatever comes out of it. So. Um, I never feel like I'm tied to to my questions in, in, in any way. But I, it's in the back of my mind, right? I, this is some things I would like to find out about. But if it doesn't come up, I'm okay with that too because, you know, I, I allow myself that flexibility. But all the while I'm thinking, does this really get back to my bigger question, right? As opposed to the, uh, to the little question. And so this is why I think, I, because I take that perspective when I am doing the interviews, it was also sort of to, to see that kind of a interaction where I felt like there's an agenda to meet, there's an agenda to meet, and if we're not meeting that. Meeting I, that I think it's, a, it's really a tension between <coughs> flexibility yeah. and 
Yeah. You want to have some degree of yeah. control. Yeah. I mean, you're there for yeah. a reason. Mm -hmm. But also, I mean, in the end, did you feel like the story he told you in his mind connected in some way? Of course, absolutely. It was a beautiful, holistic narrative mm -hmm. from beginning to end. And it <laughs> ended up with... <laughs> 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 really, and it ended up with... Uh, it was a whole string of stories. So the end was something like uh, he met the chief minister of a state who told his son something to the effect of so many stories, right? You know, look at this man who's done whatever wonderful stuff. And so that was kind of the end, the rewards part of what he got out of it. Um, also, when commenting on conspicuous consumption in the corporate sector, everything came out through little stories which was uh, great, but I've always thought, this is something I want to ask you. Now, like you, like you explore Gina's narratives, I think this person's narrative requires uh, you know, a focused narrative analysis on its own, because I was trying to draw themes across participants' narratives, okay. right? Okay. And I found that challenging. When I'm trying to draw themes, I found this person's particularly challenging to tap uh, on, I mean, in terms of trying to find common themes. So this person's kind of really stood out. All the others, I could draw some kind of common themes, whether it is nation building or um, paternalistic notions of CSR or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did tap into paternalistic, but his kind of really stood out. And uh, it, it challenged me in the sense that I couldn't just draw across, but then but when I saw you doing the Gina narrative one, that made a lot of sense because this one, I think, calls out for that kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. And it contributed, I mean, with Gina, it still contributed to a more general yes. model. Yes. Um, so I think you do have to give yourself the free. So if you're looking for categories across, you're doing grounded theory, right? Yeah. Um, which is great in itself. Reisman makes the distinction, she talks, she has a whole chapter on thematic narrative analysis, and she compares it with grounded theory, and she said, well, the difference is, though, that you keep the boundaries of the story. Um, so it's different than grounded theory, because you're not, you know, trying to cross all those. But does that mean and so with this particular respondent, it may be worthwhile just to do a very intensive analysis of what he was telling you and then what bearing it has on the corporate issues. Um, there's also research like Icha is doing where she is doing kind of life histories, um, but she has 35 of them. <laughs> Um, but does that mean she has to do grounded theory? She might be doing grounded theory, but she could also do narrative, but um, then what she's probably going to do is to create a typology of stories from her 35 that mm -hmm. she's hearing among her population this genre of story and this genre of story. And we'll see that we're going to start reading Arthur Frank um, in the next two weeks. And that's what he's doing. So he looked at many different individual stories of illness, which is what he's interested in. But then he saw that there were kind of meta narratives mm -hmm. that these individual things fit in. So it's not the same as grounded theory, where you're just crossing. Um, you leave behind the stories mm -hmm. to get a list of categories mm -hmm. from which to theorize. And by the way, that's what people often forget with grounded theory, is that there's a theory part to it. A lot of people come up with this big list of categories, but what does that mean? So if you're doing grounded theory, make sure you use it to really theorize when you're done. If you're doing narrative, we also want to theorize. Um, and it's possible to do one or two or three individuals and get a ton out of it, like I hope I did with Gina. But I think it's also possible to um, 
to come up with these sort of meta narrative kind of categories. These kind of stories share these characteristics. Okay, I can definitely see the potential um, for this study that I, I did and that each one was involved on the media use of juvenile delinquents and youth at risk. So we went to like rehabilitation homes where these boys were being held. And then first we spoke to the social workers, the counselors who knew their case histories. And then after that, we spoke to the boys themselves. Um, in terms of actually eliciting as much as we would have liked from the boys, I think it was difficult because they clearly had troubled pasts and they weren't necessarily willing to confront their past uh, to the extent that we wanted to probe. And we also didn't want to be and with too women in our viewers. Exactly. We did have a, a, a man on the team. Um, but there, there were also issues of ethics, right? Because to get it past the IRB was a job and a half because they were really worried about the fact that this was a population that was quite vulnerable and so on. And so we had to have various kinds of questions toned down significantly. Um, so we couldn't ask anything new because we had recorded and kind of put us in a position where yeah. we were like, well, what promise of confidentiality and we turned around and right. right. Yeah, the ethical yeah. issues when you're asking about uh, things that are very personal or that could actually get somebody in trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so there's accommodations that need yeah, to change, change, them. change yeah. the direction. Yes, <laughs> yeah. but I, I do see a lot of potential for us to look at those, some of the cases in the, using the narrative approach, and also you can see meta narratives across the cases. Yes, so. yeah, and that way you don't have to implicate an, an yeah. individual. Yeah. Yeah. What I did, and then this is the piece that, uh, that we were talking about, is also. That, um, and some of the things that she said really struck, struck me because I'm always challenged by my position uh, when we agree that to, to what extent can I be an objective researcher and have this purpose, but to what extent do I bring myself to be part of that. Part of that. So for this project, I will, it was completely uh, about me as much as it, as it was about the, the question. When did she give some specifics? So, so, the, so I ended up I'm writing or ended up writing a piece where it really is a story about both of us, right? In terms of um, how we tell stories about the same I mean, same culture that you come from, but different interpretations because of what you have or don't have, or where you are in in life. So it really. Um, and then when the first thing she says here in terms of the researcher does not find narratives but instead participates in this in their creation is I think the position I was taking is that I'm there to kind of create this. But in creating that, I am just as equally a participant as are my participants. So this is why it was easy for me to perhaps say, well, I, my agenda is just to understand and know who they are and why they've come to be um, you know, in, in a certain way or how they understand that to be. So there wasn't, I wasn't really tied to um, in answering a certain kind of, of um, question because I, it really was about this idea that um, we could. And then, so you know, now as I'm writing it, it's, it's really a fun, fun for me too because I get to really put myself in my research and this has been the f the, by far the, the funnest paper I have uh, ever and because there's, I can I, I feel like I can say it I can say what I'm thinking I can say where I'm coming from I can put myself in the in the research I don't have to remove myself in the narrative I can tell you how I understand the narrative um, and, and from my perspective and so um, so it's really I mean I don't know if anybody else would think it's fun but I certainly have fun <laughs> <laughs> writing it in, in that sense because I really feel like how I was listening and what I was asking or what I walked into the room gave me a different set of interviews or different sort of life stories because I may be listening for certain things or I see a certain thing or I ask a certain question or I say, oh, but Mike's, you know, kind of have a conversation in return as opposed to a question saying, oh, really, but, oh, that's really, I, I, mean, I, I don't understand that because this is really something that's something that I, I've never seen, right? To kind of respond and putting my response out there in terms of, of can you help me understand understand this as well. So it was a very different 
way of doing an interview than I did for my dissertation, right, which was very much like I had it was a grounded theory, so we had I had to have my you know think about my themes and my questions are very very different in terms of um, any kind of narrative research that I have done so far, which always you know um, you do think about your questions. Well, and, uh, I, I want to respond to what you're saying. Mary, do you need to go? Yeah, I, I need to go, but yeah, I, I'm let me really just, like, let me really just say to something about the um, assignment for next time, and then I'm going to come back and, and respond to each of um, uh, Next time we're doing performative, um, it, we're doing narrative as performance, are we not? Am I wrong? Yeah, so we are doing. Yeah, yes. narrative performance. Yeah, we, so we're, we're doing narrative research as performance next time. And we're, so you're going to see somebody perform the research. Um, and so, sorry, that's my text thing responding to me. Um, so what I did is give you, this is somebody who had been a doctoral student with me. Um, I've assigned the chapter in which she wrote her data as grounded theory, okay? So you can see kind of a more typical writing of what she's talking about. She's in her, she did interviews with like 25 women who are considered obese or overweight and their experiences in general and specifically with the healthcare system. Then what we're going to see in class is her taking the same data and performing it. And when you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but I just wanted to explain why her dissertation chapter is there. Just And again, you don't have to read every detail. It's just to get the comparison in the way the data is presented. Second is we're going to start reading Arthur Frank who has this typology of illness stories. So, and, and Bonnie, the woman who performs, will make reference to Arthur Frank, so it kind of fits together. Um, we're reading two of his chapters for tomorrow and two for the next time. So that's, that's all I wanted to say before Mary left us. Um, and I, can yeah. I just add, the, uh, yeah. the thing that in her article, I think that from everything that she said, the thing that struck me the most in terms of, I think, my experience, regarding not only in this project but in the other narrative story that I've done, is, is when she says the specific wording of the question is less important than the interviewer's emotional attentiveness and engagement and the degree of uh, reciprocity in the conversation. And that, to me, in some ways, encapsulates how I think of uh, narrative interviews, regardless of, because it cannot always be free in, in, in getting in, in interviews and in stories. Sometimes it is more structured, but I think, to me, that was really like, what I think of uh, when I think of narrative. Yes, um, that, that's a very important statement. I think also what you said, each about positionality. I mean, does anybody believe really they're an objective researcher? Does that exist? I mean, your people, you bring your personhood into your research. And for the students that I work with that are doing any kind of qualitative research, whether it's narrative or not, and I don't know what I would say if I taught you know, more positivist, statistical kind of, I think I might still say the same thing, but I know it's not done. But in qualitative research, positionality, accounting for who you are and what you're bringing to your research is, I think, critical because it's going to shape your whole interpretation of it. We're doing interpretive research, and so if you don't account for that, I think you're really being remiss, actually. So not only in this piece that you did, although this is, this is more about your direct response with your respondents. Um, yeah. For me, it also matters a lot in the recruitment. I'm dealing with 
in vitro fertilization for women who are going for in vitro fertilization. So it mattered a lot to them that um, I said that I also had been experience with in vitro fertilization back in San Francisco. And so the women who said yes to me were the women who were curious about that, or that I also have an adopted son, or so for the women who were successful, they were interested about that. And, and then when I was in the, in the interview with them, I, I started to highlight the differences between us so that they'd be more um, patient in explaining, like, no, oh, this, this is Singapore health system, so I'm not from here. And then they would go into detail about the complementary. Sort of take you under their wing. Right, yes. right, right. But at first, it's really, my, my recruitment letter is really emphasizing um, are the sameness between us, and that I'm also participating in the in the forums that they also participated in, and I could also cite the stories that they were And reading. that helped with your it, recruitment. It helped a lot, though. I still had a very high rejection rate, but the the women who said yes were curious about the similarities that we might have had. I thought I would uh, read you just. I don't know, it kind of tickles me. I don't know if it will tickle you or not. But this is um, one of my doctoral students from her dissertation who did ethnography. She's Indian. She's from Bangla Bangalore. And um, she was looking at food insecurity in one of the big slums in Bangalore. And for her first at least month or maybe month and a half, she would um, go from her parents' home and walk to the slum, and she was trying to make inroads with the people there, and she was feeling kind of frustrated, and she knew she wasn't doing very well. So in her dissertation, she wrote a part called Confessions of an Ethnographer, <laughs> and she talked about the real problems that she had and how things worked out, and this, this one is my favorite. She says, Mom accompanied me to the slum yesterday. Today. Yesterday I was feeling a bit down. I'm making little progress connecting with people. They answer questions and they talk to me when spoken to only. When I walk past their homes, they acknowledge my presence. However, there is something missing. I'm not going to be able to collect data if it continues like this. So she's really worried about her data collection. I took mom to the field and introduced her as my colleague. I think they bought it. I, I told Solomon, who was her research, so was like a research assistant, to take the day off and catch up on his field notes. I was worried when mom stepped foot into the um, slum. I told her to wear a simple sari and not call attention to herself. She did not listen. <laughs> she actually wore a beautiful turquoise blue sari. It looked like it was raw silk, but it wasn't. I always made sure I wore a simple salwar, which is um, kind of like a tunic thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have seen other women wear salwars like mine, but mom didn't want to do that. I didn't want to argue, so I let her come wearing that sari and her overpowering rose perfume. <laughs> I wanted to see if there was something I can do better to connect with women. She has volunteered in slums before. In her free time, she teaches children at a government hospital. She has a good understanding of the type of people I am meeting with. Before leaving, I show her the interview guide, and I told her what I would be talking about. We were to focus on what they liked and disliked about their community. This is a very general topic. She agreed to sit quietly and listen and watch. I could tell she was not too enthusiastic about coming and didn't think she could help. Nalini saw us entering the slum. I waved and she waved back. We walked her, her home. She immediately asked my mom who she was. My mom replied, I work for her. She is going to teach me something. <laughs> I then asked Nalini if I could talk with her while she was washing her dishes. She agreed. Mom and I both sat on the dusty piles of brick. I could tell Mom was itching to talk. Before she could say anything, 
I started to shoot questions to Nalini. I asked her, what do you like about living in this community? She looked up, laughed, and replied, I don't know what to say. I didn't say anything for a few seconds to give her some time to think. I then filled the silence. There must be something you like here, right? Nalini continued to wash her dishes. She kept scrubbing her dishes. <laughs> the bottom of the pressure cooker that she was scrubbing was looking black and worn out from extensive cooking. Everyone was silent. Mom then opened her mouth and told Nalini, you know, even my pressure cooker has those black stains. Someone told me when you pressure cook, if you put the thick skin of a lemon or lime, it will not go black. You can even use it for cooking and then put the used lemon. It can even reverse the stain. You try it. Nalini stops scrubbing, looks at my mom and says, oh, is that so? My God, I waste so much time scrubbing this. I will do it from next time. Mom was not supposed to talk. Still, <laughs> she immediately changed the topic and proceeded to talk about the neem tree. Nalini was growing a neem tree next to her house. Is that a neem tree? It's so good. What do you use it for? Neem is so good. Can I have some leaves from the lower branches? I was starting to get annoyed, but I couldn't get Mom to look at me. She was engrossed in the conversation. They were talking about making neem face packs to improve their complexions <laughs> and grinding the leaves for cleaning their bodies. It was almost like a competitive event. Nalini could sh would share how she used neem and my mom would add to the list. The conversation on neem ended with my mom saying how neem can be used as a natural deworming medicine. Nalini excitedly said, oh really, you know, we have so many worms in our water. When my child was newborn, we used to buy this Larry water from the market. Now I just strain this water and drink. I think I will start giving them neem leaves for the worms. I thought mom would start realizing she had completely deviated from the plan. <laughs> Nalini's young son came out of the tin shed. He was wearing his school uniform. I could tell he was getting ready to school. My mom called him towards her, and Nalini smiled and told her, go, go to auntie. He then looks at mom and says, she then looks at mom and says, can you please tell him to study better? <clears throat> we spent so much money sending him to school, he does not study well, always roaming and playing. Mom looks at her son, Rabi, and with a stern voice, she tells him, why are you doing that? Why are you troubling your mother? Is what your mother saying true? Are you going to continue being a bad student? She then looked at Nalini and said, listen, if he continues this behavior, don't send him to school. Let him not go to school. Let him stay at home while all his friends go to school. They will learn and they will progress. Nalini then adds, you are right. I'll stop his school after this month and won't pay the fees next month. Robbie looked petrified. <laughs> <laughs> he went back into the tin shed and got his bag. Within a few minutes, he put his shoes on and left for school. Just as he was running away, Nalini said, if I hear one complaint today, I will stop your school. 